Hi everyone, my name is Roman. Today I'm going to tell you about Kotlin coroutines and Kotlin flows and how we can use them instead of Rx Java. This presentation can, can be interesting for developers who did not have a chance to use Kotlin flows. If you are familiar with Rx Java, it will be easy enough to understand Kotlin flows. This presentation is divided in two parts. Uh, Kotlin coroutines and Kotlin flow. Uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions during presentation. Today's agenda, so Kotlin coroutines, suspending functions, uh, coroutines demo, Kotlin flow, flow demo, and some flow benefits over Rx Java. We cannot start talking about Kotlin flows without saying several words about coroutines. Even for those who already know about Kotlin coroutines, uh, it can be interesting to, to refresh your knowledge. Maybe you will see something new. Uh, before Kotlin coroutines, let's take a look at this general problem. We have some long running blocking task that blocks our thread. In this example, uh, you could see that uh, when we click on some button, we uh, set starting uh, start text. Uh, those functions are defined here in order to understand what it will show. It actually will show current time, including uh, milliseconds. And after thread sleeps for five seconds, we will see a completion text. Uh, as you know, thread sleep is thread blocking function. And I created application that uh, during work refreshes um, the, its UI and shows current time 10 times per second, about 10, 10 times per second, just uh, to show how UI is responsive. So when we tap on this button, when we make thread sleep for five seconds, our UI is frozen. Even button animation is also frozen. Obviously, we cannot do thread sleep in UI thread. There are different approaches uh, how we can handle this situation. As you can see from this demo, we will try different approaches. The first one is thread sleep with async task. We will use async task uh, in, uh, to handle the situation when we block UI thread. Uh, as you know, it has pre-execute, doing background and post-execute methods. In pre-execute, we set starting, te uh, starting text. Uh, then in doing background, we uh, run some uh, blocking function. Uh, we will use thread uh, sleep uh, for uh, all the presentation. And in post to the queue, we will show completion text. Run this example. And we can see that UI is not blocked. Uh, we wait for five seconds. We have a starting message and completion mes uh, message. And the difference in time is actually five seconds. Another choice is to use Rx Java. As we will have only one result, it's enough to use only single. It has um, a short implementation, uh, pretty nice. Uh, it does actually the same. Uh, set text, sleep for five seconds, and completion text. Let's check how it works. It works the same way. It does not block UI thread. The next one is local broadcast receiver. Its implementation it's a bit, uh, is a bit messy. Uh, we have to write plenty of code. First of all, we need to have uh, some event uh, to create receiver, to register this receiver. And on uh, when we click the button, we will uh, launch the thread with runnable uh, runnable will sleep for five seconds, and after that, we send intent uh, using lo local broadcast manager. When we receive the event, we will uh, show the text. Let's check the implementation. 
Yes, it also works. Another one to use handler. So handler is pretty good choice. It requires not very much of writing the code. It's easy to read. Approach almost the same. When we click on the button, we set text, we launch thread with runnable that sleeps that sleeps for five seconds, and uh, after five seconds, we set completion text. It also works, it does not block UI thread. The final one is with live data. For this purpose, we need to create mutable live data. It should uh, create observer, which will set the value. And when we click on the button, we set text, we launch thread, and after five seconds of delay, we post value. It also works. The good thing with all these approaches, they can work in parallel, they will not block each other. So all of these approaches can work in different strengths and everything fine. But all of these approaches have its disadvantages. For example, async task is deprecated in API level 30 because of constant problem with context leaks, missed callbacks, etc. Uh, Rx, we need to register it's disposable in order to cancel work uh, which is running. Also to add the whole library in order to have this, uh, to implement this uh, um, functionality, it's maybe not the best solution. Broadcast receiver requires to, to write a lot of code and we also need to unregister our receiver somewhere in on stop or on destroy. Handler is pretty good, but uh, it, was not, it is not connected to view life cycle. In case if you is destroyed, it continues working. Live data is really good one, maybe the best uh, of these approaches because it uh, relays on view life cycle. If you is destroyed, live data will not receive the event and uh, it will not be updated. So we can think and we can try to remember other possible approaches that could uh, solve uh, this problem. But uh, is there any way to implement it more, let's say more beautiful, having less code and to make the code more readable? Yes, obviously it's coroutine. It, this block of code actually makes all the same which all of these examples and even more it is connected to view life cycle all at once but we will talk about uh, quarantine implementation a bit later after we uh, take a look on coroutines what are coroutines according to some definition it's some design pattern Another definition that coroutines are lightweight threads. Mm, I would say that coroutines are not threads, but some entities that can share the same thread. And those coroutines don't block the whole thread. They pause its execution and release the thread for other similar entities for other coroutines. You can see that coroutine, for example, number one is executed three times, but it has some, uh, not delays, but interruptions. And it allows other coroutines to run on the same thread. What is the magical mechanism to allow other coroutines to work on the same thread? It's suspending functions. Suspending functions, they don't block the thread, but they pause execution of their coroutine. You can see a comparison of two examples when we have a usual implementation, regular implementation without coroutines, that if when we block thread, nothing can use it, or with coroutines that some other work can happen. Or 
another picture that shows exactly the same function r. It's suspending point. Uh, thread uh, is available for other coroutines, function b executed at this time, and function when fun function b executed, function r can continue working. Suspending function a function that have keyword suspend. There are many built-in suspending function. Among them, delay its built-in suspending function that does exactly the same as thread sleep, but without blocking current thread. And it was in the example you could see on the previous slide. If we need, we can write our, our own suspending function. We will talk a bit later how to implement them properly. There are two limitations for these suspending functions. Unfortunately, they cannot be called from the regular called, uh, code. They can be called or from other suspending function or from coroutines. From uh, coroutines. Uh, this delay function, for example, that does not block current thread, uh, it uses another thread for its uh, completion. And all other suspending function actually will, will use another thread in order to implement some long running task. Uh, how suspended function can handle, uh, can manage threads they are working on. It can be made using dispatchers. If you worked with RxJava, you know that the equivalent of this is schedulers. Uh, in Rx, uh, there, are, there are maybe about 10 schedulers, if I'm not mistaken, 9, 10, or something like that. In Kotlin, we have only four schedulers, uh, only four dispatchers. Dispatcher main, it's dispatchers that use main thread uh, for operating with UI object. Equivalent is Android schedulers main thread. Dispatcher default. It's uh, default dispatcher that used by all standard coroutine builders. And the number of threads that is used by this dispatcher that is used by this dispatcher is maximum of CPU cores, but at least two. Analog is uh, scheduler's computation in Rx. Dispatcher's I.O. Uh, it is designed for blocking uh, input-output tasks. Also, additional threads can be created on demand during work. Threads number is 64 threads or the number of cores if it is bigger. And this number 60, 64 is configurable. One more important thing that dispatchers EO shares thread with dispatchers default, so they can have common threads. The equivalent is uh, schedulers EO in Rx. There is one more dispatcher unconfined. It has very interesting behavior, but in order not to spend too much time on describing of it, we will skip it and we will not focus on it right now. In our presentation, we will use these three dispatchers and in many applications, it's enough to use only uh, these dispatchers. When I was uh, talking about dispatchers default, I said that uh, it's used by default by all standard coroutine builders. What are quarantine builders? Quarantine builders uh, function that actually create quarantine. They can be called from the regular code. There are three quarantine builders. The first one is run blocking. It has very interesting descriptions that you need to avoid uh, usage of this quarantine uh, builder. Why? Because it uh, blocks the thread uh, where it's executed. You can see here three examples that uh, do exactly the same for uh, each of these coroutine builders. It prints hello world. In this example, when we uh, run this example, we print hello, then we block our thread for two seconds. And if it is UI thread, it will block UI thread the same way as thread sleep does. 
and after two seconds of delay, it will display world. Why do we need this uh, coroutine builder which blocks current thread? Sometimes we cannot avoid the situation. Uh, cases when we use this builder, it's uh, tests. Uh, when all tests should be run sequently and we don't need asynchronous execution of them. One more thing, if it is not connected to Android but to Java, we can put a main function into run blocking. Uh, it will make us uh, sure that all coroutines are completed in these tasks. And when function main is completed, it means that all coroutines are finished. In other cases, it's not a good solution to use this uh, coroutine builder. Two others that are commonly used is launch and uh, async. Uh, they are launched by coroutine scope. About coroutine scope, I will tell you in next slide. The key difference between those uh, two builders, launch and async, it's uh, launch, fire and forget. We just launch coroutine and we don't care when it's completed and uh, what coroutine can return, what value it can return. And async uh, builder creates a coroutine that can return value if needed. Here we can see two examples. Launch returns job object. Job object, it's an uh, entity that can cancel, can, that can cancel this coroutine. Uh, in this particular example, when job cancel line is commented, it will print hello world at first. Uh, how it's working? We launch coroutine. We don't uh, wait here for execution. We launch coroutine and uh, continue executing our application code. We printed hello, then we block current main thread with run blocking and wait for two seconds. Meanwhile, uh, coroutine that we created here waits for one second and after that it uh, print line, it prints world. Uh, when this um, uh, piece of code is executed, we will see hello world. If we uncomment job cancel, our application will print only hello. And that it. that's it. Async, as I already said, can return a value. Uh, when we launch, when we create a coroutine with async, it returns deferred result. Deferred is wrapper uh, over some type. Uh, so we define what type this coroutine should return and the last line of the coroutine is our value. Uh, so when we launch this coroutine, we also use run blocking and we use here deferred result await. It will wait until this coroutine finished and uh, returns the value. It will return uh, word world and we print line hello world. I've mentioned that uh, coroutine scope launches uh, coroutines using launch and async builders and global scope one of these uh, coroutine scope. Moving on to next slide. Coroutine scope is just an interface which contains coroutine context. If you're not familiar with um, with coroutines, it may be messy. Coroutine builders, coroutine scope, coroutine context. But after a while, you will uh, distinguish them and it will be easy. For now, we can focus, we can just focus that coroutine scope is interface that contains coroutine context. And coroutine context, it's set of different properties. It includes job. You remember job from previous slide. It uh, also includes information about dispatcher uh, that is used to run this coroutine. It contains coroutine name and exception handler. We will not cover exception handler in our demo because it's separate topics that takes uh, some time. Uh, let's uh, take a look on global scope. 
it's coroutine scope. It's a built-in coroutine scope in a Kotlin framework, in coroutines framework. When we say the global scope launch, by default, it uses dispatcher default, not IO as here on this picture, but dispatcher default. It waits for one second and then prints hello world. It's fire and forget. It means that we don't care about the result. If we want to have the result, we say coroutine scope, currently global scope, async, uh, deferred result is has uh, stream type, and hello world is the result. After that, we use run blocking, we get this result. On Android, we have a different built-in coroutine scopes. And uh, we can use them, it will be easy for us uh, uh, to use them in uh, different cases. For example, among them, life cycle scope, view model scope, global scope, and custom scope. Life cycle scope, it's built-in coroutine scope. Exists an activity and fragment. Here are examples of its usage. You can see that uh, life, cycle, life cycle scope can be used from activity or fragment. It uses main thread by default. The good thing is that it is connected to view life cycle. If activity or fragment is destroyed, then all coroutines that were created by this uh, coroutine uh, scope, they will be automatically canceled. View model scope, it's also built-in coroutine scope, exists in Android view model. Uh, it also uses dispatchers, dispatchers main by default, and it cancels all its coroutine when view model is destroyed. For example, if you rotate screen, your views uh, can be destroyed, but view model continues uh, living. And view model will be destroyed if you leave that particular screen. In this case, it will be, all coroutines will be canceled. Global scope. It's not recommended to use it in application, only in some particular cases. Uh, all coroutines that are launched by this global scope, they will be running as long as application is running. There is no, we don't have automatic uh, lifecycle handling uh, for, as with lifecycle scope and view model scope. Uh, all jobs that are created by global scope should be canceled manually. It uses dispatchers default by default. And custom scope. We can create as many custom scopes as we want. To create them uh, pretty easy. You just define your variable, you create using coroutine scope uh, constructor, you define dispatcher that it will use, and that's it, you can use your scope. Let's take a look on examples how we can use lifecycle scope in our application. Also, you could see that we are going to take a look uh, at it in our in our application. So I open another fragment. Uh, let's remember that coroutine implementation of sleeping function, it's just using this short form. Life cycle scope launch, it creates coroutine that sets starting text and after sleeping it set completion text. This, uh, if we use the same implementation with thread sleep, it blocks the thread, it blocks the UI. In our case, when we launch this example, UI is still responsive, so everything is working. Uh, but you can say that uh, it's good that we have built-in delay suspending function that does exactly the same as thread sleep. What if we have another uh, blocking function, for example, that uh, makes some heavy calculation. We can use the same lifecycle scope, 
but inside this coroutine we can switch to another uh, dispatcher. Uh, you remember that by default lifecycle scope uses main thread, so dispatcher's main. Here we switch dispatcher to default and we can use any long-running blocking function, not only thread slip. Thread slip as an example that uh, shows that it will not that it will not block our thread. Let's check. You can see that UI is responsive. And in a five seconds, we can see a completion text. If you want to have uh, to get result or from from coroutine, the last line of this context it's actually output value. The only thing we need is to add reading this result. While well, result equals to and the last line is our value. Let's check how it works. UI is not blocked and we can see the end of result is output value. Uh, we can put our business logic inside uh, this this context uh, block, but it doesn't look nice. Of course, we can create some function that uh, includes all the operators, but having this structure, it still can be better. In this case, we can use suspending function, which we mentioned earlier. In order to create our suspending function, first of all, we need to add suspend keyword before fun, suspend fun. We should define dispatcher that it will use. If we don't define dispatcher that it uh, will use, it will be run on the same thread which is used by coroutine that calls this suspending function. We can have, uh, we switch it to background thread, we have some long running task. Uh, and uh, we can see that we have some strange continuation resume this. It's that magic that allows suspended function to pause execution of coroutine and to release thread. Without this block, it will not be suspended function. It will be a regular function. So we have to add continuation resume this, result success or result failure, and we pass an exception object to it. In our case, our suspended function returns string type heavy work with result. And uh, our this implementation, uh, I would say even this because we want to return some value. Looks like lifecycle scope launch. We launch on UI thread. We will set the text. We will call Kotlin suspending function. Uh, this suspending function that will return this string and we will show it in the end. Let's check. And in five seconds, we can see that completed at time with heavy work with result. One more interesting thing is to understand what is the order of execution of coroutines. For this case, let's take a look at this example. We will use atomic integer in order to be sure that it's not modified uh, simultaneously from different threads. Uh, each time when we call order, it increases value by one and uh, gets its value. When we click on the button, we will, uh, in this example, we will set for text before coroutine launch inside when it started. Uh, inside when it's completed and after launch, after this uh, coroutine block, which we launched. Let's take a look at our experiment. You can see that when I tapped on the button, three, three text uh, have appeared at once and the last one appeared the, uh, in five seconds. The first one before launch, it was obviously. Second one is started sleeping. As this coroutine uses main thread, so when we, when we created and launched the coroutine 
the coroutine, it started working on the same thread. And this is line which was executed next. After that, we called our suspending function that uh, slips in another thread for five seconds. And this coroutine, which is launched in UI thread, was suspended. It paused its execution for five seconds, but it released the thread and we moved here. You can see that third one is after launch. Uh, UI thread is released and when this uh, suspending function finished its uh, execution, after that in five seconds, you can see when it was run, so 18 seconds, 23 seconds, the last one was uh, uh, that coroutine completed at this time. Uh, you could hear that when uh, I said many times launch or async, it uses by default some dispatchers. Is there any way to use uh, another dispatcher? Actually, yes, it's quite simple. So if, if we want to use another dispatcher, we can uh, pass as a parameter to this uh, coroutine builder, uh, just, another just another dispatcher and we can uh, launch here any blocking function. It will be run in background thread. We took a look at lifecycle scope. I will tell you one more time. It is connected to view lifecycle. View its fragment or activity. Another interesting thing is custom scope. We use custom scope in those places where we don't have this built-in uh, coroutine scopes. So we can create our custom coroutine scope. I placed here implementation of suspended function just uh, uh, to keep it before your eyes. Here you can see two examples, uh, UI scope and EO scope. It's created quite simple. Coroutine scope using dispatcher and some job. About this job we will talk about Amy and scope. So on button click listener, we launch coroutine. By default, it uses main thread. It will set already known starting text, completed text after five uh, seconds of, um, of delay. So let's take a look. I launched it, started sleeping. UI is not blocked and completed in five seconds. It uses the same uh, new coroutine scope with another dispatcher and uh, another job. We launch our custom scope using our scope launch. It will create In this case, if we launch coroutine, we can set by default dispatcher's main. Uh, the better approach to use dispatcher's main right here, but I decided to show you all possible solutions, how we can use uh, scopes, how we can use, how we can launch another coroutines inside other coroutines. Uh, when we launch our coroutine in background thread, by default it's dispatcher EO, we launch another coroutine in UI thread, it changed our text and uh, it calls our suspended functions. Let's take a look how it works. So you can see that everything fine, no crashes, no thread blocking, etc. Everything is fine. The difference between built-in coroutine scopes is uh, that you have to manage 
your coroutine scope life cycle manually. It means that you should cancel all coroutines that are created by your scope, by your custom scope. And for this purpose, we use these jobs. When we create our scope, we connect a parent job. And when we cancel this parent jobs, all coroutines that were created by our scope are automatically canceled, including coroutines that were launched inside those coroutines. Let's take a look on job cancellation more detail. I already said about jobs and we have next example. When I tap on this button, I will launch coroutine. Uh, it will be launched by UI scope. Inside of it, I set starting text and launch another three coroutines. First one in three seconds, we will put one. Second uh, coroutine will uh, set text to two. Third one will set to three. You can see that I used here launch and async to show variety how you can launch coroutines. Let's check how it works. I tap the button. One, two, three. So this will appear in one second, in three seconds, this one in four seconds, and this one in five seconds. You can see that I have inner job and outer job. Outer job is the job which was created by UI scope when we launched it. And inner job, it's a job that was created by uh, when we launched this small coroutine inside this coroutine. Let's take a look how it works when we cancel at first inner job. I will launch uh, I will press uh, two buttons at once, and after that, we'll press this button. We try to cancel this. Something went wrong, or maybe I forgot to tap. Ah, yes, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I tap this uh, button, and we can see that this coroutine uh, has not finished. It was canceled. This one and this one, have been finished. Now I'm going to cancel outer job, this job. You can see in five seconds that this coroutine has been finished and this one, all coroutines inside of it were canceled. And the last experiment, I will cancel this UI job that was created uh, when uh, a fragment was created. I will launch again and cancel UI scope job. In five seconds, none of coroutines are completed and even more. It's canceled and when I tap again, no coroutines are launched again because UI job has been canceled uh, here, canceled, and it was not recreated again. In, in order to recreate, I have to recreate the fragment, and only after that, uh, everything works. Before we move to flows, do you have any questions about coroutines? Okay, let's assume that you don't have questions, but please feel free to interrupt. Yeah, Any... one quick question uh, from a sense for great overview for, for the coroutines. Uh, do we have, or there is some best practice? Uh, yeah, I know there is a back, uh, good practice to uh, to move uh, like lo long running task, uh, task on uh, dispatcher IO or for default, something like that. But are there any specific number, for example, I have some, uh, some UI related task, for example, but it's anyway it takes very long time to, to execute. Is it safe to run it uh, on the on the main thread on the main dispatcher, or the system will react somehow, uh, like crash or I don't know. Uh, five seconds you can catch application not responding, but mm -hmm. if you are talking about user experience, it's uh, better not to have tasks that uh, run more than, if I'm not mistaken, more than 1.1 
0.1 second. So one tenth of the second user can notice it and it's bad user experience. So if you have this long running task, it's better to run some coroutine and to launch uh, the task there. Actually a thread is, uh, it is better to use only to update UI components and that's it. All other possible stuff, if it is possible, it's better to put inside coroutines. If it is connected to UI uh, thread to, to work with UI, we have built in um, life cycle uh, scope and view model scope, uh, which we can use and it manages uh, life of uh, coroutines automatically. You don't have to cancel job manually. It will uh, do it for you. So it's very convenient uh, to use them. And uh, my advice to use those scopes, built-in scopes, which are really helpful. In critical situations, there's not going to be um, any other exception, just that UI is not responding. I'm, I'm just thinking about some hypothetical uh, situation when we need to populate like uh, millions of records in a table, something like that. So. Million records in a table definitely should be background thread. So it should be launched in a coroutine that uses background thread. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Moving on to flows, but before that, we have to talk about channels because we will use them in our demo. Channels is not something new. In Rx Java, or I'm sorry, in Java, it's blocking queue. Uh, the difference is in names, uh, send instead of put and take and receive instead of take, uh, it has the same behavior. Uh, but the difference is this send and receive functions are suspending functions. It means that we can call them only from coroutines. But we have offer function. You can see that it's a regular function that can be called not from coroutine. And channels, uh, it's interface that extends both of send channel and receive channel we will use this offer function later. It's common information about channels. I'm pretty sure all of you face it with the channels or something similar in other languages. Uh, we will use one of channel implementation, conflated broadcast channel. Um, in a rigs, it's behavior subject. As it, uh, what it means that it means the channel keeps only one value that can be rewritten and that's it. If consumer uh, cannot process those values too fast, is not, uh, if consumer is not fast enough, these values are just lost. For example, uh, blue and red values are lost and are not received. We use this channel when we are interested only in last result. Conflated broadcast channels, uh, keyword broadcast channels, it means that all subscribers will receive these values. If it is just conflated channel, that, uh, then only one of subscriber only one of subscribers will receive the value. If we want that all subscribers uh, receive the value, we should use conflated broadcast channels. Here is example of its implementation. We created we create some broadcast channel with string type, and we use from regular code channel offer and some string. We pass there some string. We launch coroutine from global scope. One more time, don't use it. It's just for demo purposes in order not to create some custom scope. We could use here life cycle scope or other. Uh, so inside of coroutine, we open subscription, consume value and print line. Here is example of usage of a conflated broadcast channel. And now flows. How we can build them? There are four builders 
for flow builders that we can use. Actually, flow is uh, almost the same as uh, observables in Rx Java. In Rx Java, we have five types of them, single, maybe, completable, uh, observable, and flowable, if I'm not mistaken. In uh, Kotlin, we have just flow. Flow is interface that has only one suspending function, collect. And collect is the same as live data, observe, and in uh, Rx, it's uh, also observe. The same with flow, collect. We collect our values. Four types of builders. First one, flow of. We pass one or several values. It's fixed set. And collect, when we uh, write collect with lambda functions that accept the value and print it, we will see this example for this uh, type of builder. It's the same as uh, in a Rx uh, observable just as flow. Extension function that can convert many type of object into a flow. In our case, we have conflated broadcast channel and we converted it to a flow using a flow extension. Uh, so you can see we created channel, we converted to flow, then wrote this collect function. When we wrote, uh, when we offered this channel this value, flow receives this value and print it. Flow is coming. Flow. It's builder function that has um, um, that has block and inside of it we can emit our values uh, manually sequently. So we write flow. Inside flow, it's uh, our implementation of our flow. We use keyword emit, key function, I'm sorry, key function emit, and we pass values. So we emit value. We sleep for one second without blocking current thread. And after that, we emit loaded. And we can see in output uh, this uh, values. Channel flow, it's almost the same as flow with the difference that we use not emit, but send function and calls can be potentially concurrent inside this building. In many cases, it's enough to use just flow builder. In our demo, we will use as flow and uh, flow constructor. Let's remember how we handle results in Rx Java. In Rx Java, when we subscribe to observable, we have four callback function on next, on error, on complete, on subscribe. But with flow, you remember that it's interface and has only one collect. How we can handle all the situation? How, how we can live with that? And there is one pattern that can be used in any application. You defined some class that is, that is wrapper over your result. You can see your, uh, your data has uh, this generic type and uh, it will be returned by success. It's inner class that uh, extends its parent class. For other cases, we add loading start, for example, complete and error. We can add as many as, many as we want uh, different states for this data result. It's one of the examples. And this example can be used in the whole application if all the states are applicable for flows. Or you can implement as many of these wrappers with its uh, nested states as you want. Here is an example of usage of this uh, data result. We create flow using our flow builder uh, with Lambda implementation inside of it. It returns data result of type string. So we emit data result loading start. You can see that it does not take this um, type uh, 
this returning type. For this purposes, Kotlin has built in nothing interface, nothing class. You can just use it, or you can read about it. I have set it as some cached values. For example, we read it from database or from memcache, disk cache, we got this value and emitted a result, a result to consumer. And uh, by the way, you can see that here, uh, it can be view that collects uh, all, uh, all the data. When we get result, we check what type of this result. If data result is loading start, we can show progress bar. If it is success, uh, we have automatic casting. We know that if result has type di data result success, then it has data, um, data property and we can use it. So displayed result with some data. If it is data result error, we process this error somehow. You can see that uh, I skipped data result complete, which is sent in this flow. Again, it's optional, it's not necessary. It's up to you to use this state or not to use this state. Uh, in our demo, I didn't use the state because it's uh, not necessary at all. I used loading start success and error, but it, it is an example how we can use flow with different states and how we can process them. Another good thing about flow, it can be easily converted to live data with as live data extension function. So you have flow, you put as live data, and from this moment it's live data. You can observe it the same way as you do with live data in your project. You pass the, some view lifecycle owner and observer that uh, consumes these values. Uh, we were talking about flows and before that we were talking about coroutines that could use different threads. How flow use different threads? They use it with flow on function. In a rix it's, uh, mm, it's similar to it's similar to subscribe on and observe on, but still it has differences because in a rix subscribe on it is applied for all uh, operators upstream and downstream, and observe on is applicable only for downstream operators and observe on overrides subscribe on uh, uh, scheduler. Uh, in Kotlin, flow on uh, applies and changes the thread only for upstream operators until the next flow on. Let's take a look at this example. We have this flow, which then collected somehow. The first one will be executed on this dispatcher, flow on dispatcher's default. And for each of uh, uh, for, for, for each of function, we will print the thread name. Cur currently, in this block, you can see that it's dispatcher default. We use dispatcher default, and you can see in output that it's default dispatcher. Second function, it is uh, above flow on dispatcher's main, and use main thread. After that, third, functions that use dispatcher's EO. And very interesting situations that despite the fact we use dispatcher's EO, we use the same thread as we used with dispatcher's default. You remember when we were talking about dispatcher's default and dispatcher's EO, I said that dispatcher EO shares the same thread as, uh, use the same threads as dispatcher's default. And in this particular example, uh, during demo preparation, I face this situation when dispatcher EO used the same thread from this dispatcher. And the last, and the last line, it uh, will be executed in the same thread in which 
uh, flow collect was called. When uh, we call flow collect, collect is suspended function. It means that it should be called from coroutine or from another suspending function. In our case, coroutine is created by lifecycle scope and lifecycle scope uses by default dispatcher's main. So all operators that were not impacted by flow on, all upstream operators will run in the same thread as uh, flow collect. In our case, it's main. Do you have any questions about flow description because we are moving to the demo and it can be a bit confusing if uh, something is unclear now. Okay, let it be known. For the demo, I prepared application that will show you movies from external source, TMDB, movie da database and uh, if we make some request here it's not clear what actually happens in application and that's why the most interesting part it's not to see how application works but what happens inside of it here is the common structure of application there are two uh, our demo will consist of three parts for each of these three parts, I will use uh, different edit text. It will show different cases. Uh, logical parts consist of subscription and use case. Use case is request and, re and response flow. In this application, I used three layers. View layer, view model layer, and one big repository level, which includes uh, repository, some business logic, etc. In order to make presentation simpler, I've removed several layers, uh, layers in order not to show too much code. Subscription flow. Generally, view is subscribed to view model and receives data from live data with data result. You remember data result from previous slide. View model is subscribed to repository layer and receives data from flow. Request and response flow. When user does something in application, in our case, we will enter some text. Uh, view sends request to view model. View model sends request to repository. Repository offers value to conflated broadcast channel. Conflated broadcast channel is stored in its turn sends value to subscribers. Uh, our subscribers will be flow that uh, present in repository level as well as this channel. After that flow emits data result and send it to its subscriber to live data in view model. And uh, view model will send data result to view views, uh, using live data. Let's take a look at first demo. Subscription flow. We have view, view model and repository layer. Data provider, which uh, has flow with data result. We will use retrofit and room. In our application, retrofit is uh, for getting movies from the API and room, it's our cache implementation. So our data provider, as we could see, it returns flow, flow of data result. And this T parameter is a list of movie model. Uh, again, I will uh, remind you about the data result, what structure it has in my case. It has loading start, it has success. Success is also sealed class that consists of cached and fresh. Cached is to define that result uh, received is from room. And fresh means that we received this uh, result from the API. And error that has exception and number of attempts. So data provider provides flow. Flow of uh, 
data result, and data result, this T parameter is a list of movie model. Movie model is entity that keeps information about movie and it's stored in the room database. View model is subscribed to data provider. You can see that in view model, we use data provider get movie list network flow. So we have we, re, we have this flow, but we will return it to view as live data. Also, we defined here flow on dispatchers view, and view is subscribed to view model using live data. In a fragment, we use view model. We use this live data with the same inner type as flow. And when this live data uh, gets any sense, any result, we receive this data result and process somehow its subscription flow. Now, use case flow. In this use case flow, you can see that scheme that we saw with um, subscription flow. Now, how it works. Uh, what uh, our business logic, what happens when user does something in the application. So user entered stream. You could see that when I enter here, some, that I, when I enter text, something is happened. In our case, it's uh, on text changed. Uh, for this edit text, uh, this function was invoked. And we send request to view model. In SAS, inside of on text change, we make request. View model, search movie, and we pass the stream. View model makes request to data provider. In view model, uh, you can see search movie text to stream. Uh, this function is present in view model. Here is the stream, and we make request to data provider get movie list and pass this search stream. Data provider has conflated broadcast channel inside it with stream type, and it offers this string value. So get movie list, here is this function, and we offer this uh, value to conflated broadcast channel. The next one, broadcast channel sends its value to all subscribers. In our case, it's flow. Flow that uh, is present in data provider. We have this flow data result list of movie model. It returns flow with this type. What is the implementation of it? When flow receives the value from channel, uh, in order to receive value from conflated broadcast channel, we write channel opens subscription consume each. We received here value from the channel. When we receive this value, we send to our uh, subscribers data result loading start. At this point, UI can start drawing progress bar, for example. After that, we read data from our room, from our database. Please pay attention that room has built-in support of suspending function. So we have two functions. First one retrieves a list of movies without uh, any searching criteria. And uh, another function that search for movies uh, depending on entering stream. And in our flow implementation, we get one or another list depending on entered string. If it is not empty, we use get search movie list, this suspending function. Uh, the good thing with this suspending function from room, we actually don't know what dispatcher it use. We just know that it is that it will use some background thread. We don't know which exactly, and we don't care about it at all. We received this movie list from, from the room. After that, we emit value to our UI. Data result, success cached, cached, and we pass the cached movie list, which we retrieved from the database. 
after that we want to check maybe the data which we have uh, uh, is out of date and we need a fresh one. We make request to, retro, uh, to API using retrofit and retrofit also has the built-in support for suspending function. We also don't know what thread will be used. We have just two different queries. We query uh, that movie database external source and it will return the result, which we convert to list uh, uh, of movie model. This is extension function that just converts. It's not so interesting. We received new list of movies. After that, we emit again successful result to our subscribers, but provide new list. And after that, we write, we store this new movie list in our room in order for the next query, which we might have, uh, we would get, uh, we would get movies faster. Uh, or in case if, if it was not previously here, if our database is empty, it's first time when it will be stored. Uh, insert function into room database is also suspending function. So this is the flow which happens when we, uh, when, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, this is the flow which happens when we type here something. So we type here and we receive. Each time when text is changed, all this flow is passed, but it's fast enough, so it's hard for you to, to see the difference. Again, all the flow without highlighting some parts. Data provider has API, data, database, and conflated broadcast channel. It has get movie list function that uh, view model can call. When it is called here, request, we offer this value here, offer to conflated broadcast channel. And our flow, which was uh, provided to view model, it uh, contains, it is subscribed to this conflated broadcast channel. It accepts this value. It's emits, it emits at first data result loading start. After that, it retrieves value from database. It emits successful result with data to UI. After that, it retrieves data from API. Again, it emits successful result and uh, stores in the database. If some error happens during this business logic, we emit data result error and pass this exception, which we faced. You can see that the logic here is straightforward. It linear. This is nesting blocks is only switching what API to call. If you have only one API, it would be totally linear, no some inner blocks, etc. So everything is really easy to read. This is great benefit from coroutine. Are there any questions about first demo? Okay, moving on to, se to, second tom to second demo. In it, we will use channel as flow extension function and flow switching. Uh, subscription looks almost the same, but there are some differences. Uh, in this implementation, our room database will return results not using suspending function, but with regular functions that return flow flow of list with movie model. And our data provider will be subs is subscriber who will uh, be subscribed to these flows. These flows will act the same way as, uh, for example, if we use here live data. You know that room can return live data with some kind of list. Uh, the same is with flows. So data provider is subscribed to two these uh, flows at once. And view model is subscribed to flow which is created in data provider. 
in data provider, we will have function get movie list room flow. It will return flow of data result list movie model. You can see that uh, our room returns flow of list movie model, but we have to return data result to cover different states, loading start, exceptions, etc. And movie model is subscribed to data provider. It uses this flow and it converts it to live data with the same data result. And view is subscribed to our view model. So in this case, this part with view model and uh, uh, view is totally the same as previous one. And the difference is only in our business logic, which uh, is present in our repository level. Moving on to use case. Suddenly you can see that a new flow, additional flow appeared here. We will take a look at this example, what happens. We have two flows at once. Uh, these two flows are subscribed to the same broadcast channel. You can see that one uh, flow, uh, so channel is converted to flow. And here channel, the same channel is converted to flow. Uh, we will talk about it in a minute. So use case, it starts the same way as in previous example. User enters some text. some text and we see some result. So user enters text, we send request to view model, view model send request to data provider, data provider offers value to conflated broadcast channel and conflated broadcast channel send this value to all its subscribers. When it's sent, both of this flow receive this value. So both flow at once receive this value from the channel. In this case, uh, we receive string. In this case, we also receive string, the same actually search uh, string as in previous example. And these two flows start working simulationlessly. First one, as you can see, makes the same API call as in previous example to retrofit. It uses the same suspending function with the same syntaxes as before. Uh, API call may take, for example, for one second or something like that. Meanwhile, at the same time, in another coroutine, we check if this search string is empty or not. If it is empty, we return all movies flow. What is all movies flow in data provider? It is flow from, from the database, flow of list movie model. If it is, if the search string is not empty, then it returns another flow, flow of list movie model. But the subscriber, in our view, uh, but our view model subscriber. Uh, so you can see here how uh, we choose, in our case, when we enter it, not empty text, uh, we switch room flow. We used this flow, this one, and we return it to our view. But we have to convert our list of movie model to data result success cached. Uh, it's one of the examples how we can change the type of uh, flow. It was uh, here list of movie model and here it's data result of list of movie model. And UI gets this data actually from room. Room sends it to data provider, data provi provider to view model and view model sends it to view. Meanwhile, so this uh, operation took maybe small part of the second, but meanwhile we received a value from the API, let's say in a second. So we got this new movie list. We save the result into the room. And room, 
understand uh, that it has two open flows that should return updated value if list of stored movies inside room I change it according to the parameters, according to those queries uh, uh, that, uh, that actually open that flow. So when we store data in room, it checks the data is changed and the result of flow can be different. In case if it is different, it sends the data to subscribers if needed. If the result is not, does not differ, it will not send anything. Uh, here is another flow, as you can see, uh, another, I mean, use case for using flows. Here we used as flow and flow switching. Uh, let's take a look at it one more time. So the whole implementation logic. We have API, database, the same conflated broadcast channel, the same request uh, to data provider from view model, uh, offer value, but uh, comparing to previous examples, uh, our flow does not open subscription of the channel, it converts this channel into flow and we convert it into two different flows. And depending on entered string, we return one room flow or another room flow uh, to subscriber. Uh, the good, the interesting thing about it is that, for example, in case if for some reason a uh, room could not, uh, because of some delays or etc., room was not responsive for several seconds, uh, it's not real, but assume we have the situation and API uh, result was faster, we save result to database and anyway we will get the same result. But uh, uh, we will have only one uh, one delivery. So we will not deliver result twice, but only one time in case if uh, room for some, in some situation was not responsive. Uh, in real situation, it's almost impossible. So we could see example, how conflated broadcast channels was used by two flows and how it can be converted easily to flow. Are there any questions about this demo, about this demo part? Okay, thank you. Moving on to the third part, to the third demo. It's pretty short. It just will show how errors can be held, handled in the application. For this part of demo, I will not write those big diagrams, uh, schemas, etc. Just uh, inside Flow Builder, I will show you a fake emission of data result error. Uh, I emit error on each request three three times and after that I make API call and emit successful result. It will be done using this input field. For example, I start entering and you can see that I receive some errors uh, for entered text. Uh, there were three errors and uh, after that the last result was taken from a uh, broadcast channel. Uh, in this particular example, we can see how, um, how conflated broadcast channel will skip its values. In current implementation, uh, we search for something where field is empty or it has at least uh, three, uh, three symbols, three, cha three characters. Uh, for example, if I enter one, two, I don't make search. But if I enter three, it started searching for three. And now let's check if what will happen if I continue writing up to 10. You can see that it's generating three fake errors for one, two, three, four. And after that, next value which is consumed is the last one. This one, two, three, four, five, up to 10. So it didn't make search for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, values were skipped uh, and were taken only the last one. 
the first one which was entered and the last one. The same, the same generation will happen when I will start erasing these uh, uh, characters here. When I erase one, it will start generating fake errors and will make search for this part of text. And uh, after that, it will make search for the last value. So I start erasing. You can see that it generates for first input value and after that it generates for empty string which is now and after that it shows uh, uh, this result according to empty string. Are there any questions about error handling? Okay and the last slide is flow benefits over Rigs Java. First of all, simplicity. Flow has less builders. It has less schedulers. Thanks to Kotlin uh, coroutines, uh, thanks to Kotlin suspending functions, it has less nesting. Code is more readable. But pressure handling. Because of coroutines, there are no uh, any back pressure in flows. It's because it does not use threads, but it uses this entity that shares threads. Lifetime. In many cases, we can reuse lifecycle scope of your model scope. Built-in uh, coroutine managers, let's say, so uh, which will cancel all coroutines when view is destroyed or view, lives, or view model is destroyed. According to one, um, uh, according to test to one project that had tested um, efficiency flow may be a little bit faster than Rx, but first of all, it's not much, and uh, uh, all the benchmarks which I used, we should uh, treat those results properly. Suspending execution. You could see that we suspending function code is really good. It uses, uh, it allows to use uh, multi-threading logic to, without any nesting. Multi-platform support. Kotlin can be used in, uh, in different places. In Java, for example, in Android, maybe in other places. And this code is fully, uh, uh, cross-platform, multi-platform. With Rx Java, it has similar syntax, not the same, but similar. So a little benefit from Kotlin. Nullability support in flows. If you use Rx Java, we need to wrap those values, nullable values, with option. With flow, we can pass nullable values, and that's it. And if we use uh, suspending function, we, if we use flows, they must be used inside of coroutine scope. Uh, and it makes us uh, to, to handle properly its life cycle. When coroutine is ended, it means that we will not have some, leaker, some leaked threads. Let me summarize. We have benefits in, clo or in flow, in Kotlin flow over Rx Java. Does it mean that we need to switch to Kotlin flows and uh, rewrite Rx Java application code? Not at all. You will not get those benefits uh, too much, uh, let's say, efficiency comparing to Rx Java. Only in cases if you have some issues, for example, back pressure or leaked threads, etc., which is which is present in Kotlin flow. If you don't have those problems in Rx Java, don't rewrite it. It's very good to test how flow works and maybe to use in in your next project. It's really simple. It's easy to develop and uh, it's uh, convenient to use. Uh, for example, my new project, which started, it does not use Rx anymore. It uses only Kotlin flows and Kotlin coroutines and, and channels. And uh, I can say that it's uh, more easy to implement it and it's uh, really more readable. For me, crucial parameters were simplicity, 
lifetime or life cycle and suspending executions. It's uh, what uh, I liked most in Kotlin Flow. This is the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.